Greetings, friends of typography. Today we are looking back to the 1980s and 90s when with the Macintosh, desktop publishing became widely available and computers started to use scalable fonts. If you haven't worked with fonts 30 years ago, you might learn a few interesting things and if you have, we will probably bring back some nice memories. So let's get started. In the early 1980s, Computers were already pretty common. Teenagers were playing on computers like the Commodore 64 and in an office environment you could likely see something like an IBM PC. Creating a printout at that time usually meant to send just the text to an impact.matrix printer which made lovely sounds like this while hammering pins on an ink-soaked cloth ribbon. The fonts were based on a simple grid and were native to the printer. So of course that's not what the publishing industry used at the time to print books, newspapers, magazines and so on. The typical technique to create a quality print layout at that time was photo typesetting. The necessary equipment for this was very expensive and not something you could just set up easily yourself at home or at a small office but this changed in the middle of the 1980s. In 84, Apple introduced the Macintosh and in 85, all the pieces were in place to create what is now known as desktop publishing. Adobe had released PostScript, a device-independent page description language, which also included scalable PostScript fonts. And Apple released the PostScript-enabled laser writer to print out PostScript documents. And finally, the PageMaker design software was also released in 85 to create professional print designs using PostScript and the Macintosh. This combination of products had two major advantages. One, it was so much cheaper than the phototype setting systems and in fact it replaced the whole phototype setting industry within a couple of years. And Two, it allowed for a design process we call what you see is what you get, where the screen representation would resemble the final output and where you could directly manipulate all objects in real time. We are all used to this today, but at that time it was really a game changer and not common on consumer PCs. But let's get back to our Mac and check out what the phrase what you see is what you get actually meant back in the 1980s. It is important to note that the quality output using the PostScript fonts was only rendered inside the PostScript enabled printers or the machines producing the films for offset printing. The operating systems of the 1980s continued to use bitmap fonts, which meant that a few specific font sizes were drawn pixel by pixel and then those fonts looked fine when shown exactly in those sizes on screen. Choosing any other size would result in a poor quality and of course a highly pixelated output when larger text sizes were being selected. By the way, given how poor the output quality was, I find it fascinating to see how many style options were provided by default. It's not just bold and italic, but also outline, shadow and even small caps, subscript and superscript. And what we see here on screen is also what would be printed unless a PostScript font and a PostScript enabled printer was being used. In this case, the screen representation would still come from bitmap fonts, but the printer output would use vector outlines. And that's why those early PostScript fonts consisted of both screen fonts and printer fonts. One of the most popular applications to create PostScript fonts at that time was Fontographer originally released in 1986. Fontographer was one of the first commercially available Bezier curve editing software tools for a personal computer. Judging vector outlines on this small pixel grid of a Mac screen was still tricky of course, but now anyone owning a computer was technically able to design and release fonts. And while the established type foundries were busy converting over their traditional photo typesetting designs to PostScript, many new and small type foundries were set up, since all you needed now was just a Macintosh computer. 
looking for example at magazines during the late 1980s and early 1990s, we can clearly see how type designers and graphic designers explored and enjoyed this newfound creative freedom. And speaking of graphic designers, let's have a quick look at PageMaker. Again, the render quality on screen is pretty crude by today's standards. But graphic designers using apps like Adobe InDesign for page layouts will recognize almost everything we still use today. We have master page elements, a defined type area, text flowing automatically through columns and around images, we can save type styles for our paragraphs and so on. But again we are usually seeing a bitmap font representation of our text, even if we are going to print postscript outline fonts later on. Of course there wasn't just PageMaker. With the Mac becoming the computer for design and publishing, design apps were usually released specifically for the Macintosh, at least at first. Illustrator and Freehand for example became commonly used vector drawing applications. And Photoshop from Adobe as bitmap graphics editor doesn't even need any introduction. But in the early 1990s, with more powerful computers and better screens, the time was finally ripe for scalable fonts on all screens and printers. For Adobe, PostScript and PostScript fonts, especially Type 1 fonts with their screen optimization capabilities, were valuable and they kept it a closed system only available to licensees. An agreement with Apple for the system-level integration of PostScript fonts could not be reached. Apple instead decided to create their own outline font technology, which was released in 1991 under the name TrueType. This font format used a different mathematical description of the outlines, the path direction is the other way around compared to PostScript and the screen optimization works rather differently. TrueType shipped with macOS 7 and was also given to Microsoft and included in Windows 3.1. Now this was bad news for Adobe. Not only was there no money to be made from licensing the font technology to companies like Apple and Microsoft, but now there was also a direct competitor which threatened the success of PostScript fonts as the dominant font format. So Adobe decided to give up their previous strategy and they went ahead and published the specifications of PostScript Type 1 leading to a massive increase in the creation of professional PostScript fonts. And as a result, the font format stayed competitive. In addition, Adobe started to offer the Adobe Type Manager for macOS and Windows in the early 1990s. And these before and after pictures on the box make it clear what the software does. With it running in the background, the previously used bitmap fonts were replaced automatically and the text output for the screen and every printer was now created using the actual PostScript outline fonts. And this situation led to the so-called font wars. Two competing font formats both being used throughout the 1990s. Two type fonts became the standard format for fonts shipped with operating systems and most consumer font packages also used two type. The design and publishing industry, on the other hand, had already settled on PostScript years before TrueType was released. And in fact, using a TrueType font shortly after the introduction of the new format for a print layout could mean that rendering the design would fail completely, since the raster image processor that was being used might simply not have TrueType font support. While this was only a problem for a short period of time, while the machines were being updated or replaced, it ruined the reputation of TrueType within the design industry for many years to come, if not forever. Even today I still hear graphic designers sometimes advise against using TrueType. And to make matters worse, there weren't just two competing font formats. The font files of Windows and macOS were incompatible as well. So there was actually Windows PostScript, Windows TrueType, Mac PostScript and Mac TrueType, with PostScript fonts even consisting of multiple files per font. What a mess! This created a nice market for font conversion software, but for the users moving fonts or design projects between the two platforms was hard to do, 
and so it was usually just avoided. There was the consumer and office world using Windows and TrueType and the design and publishing world entirely relying on Apple computers and PostScript fonts. This separation also meant that there couldn't be a winner in the fight for a dominant font format. But eventually the conflict was resolved and there were two steps necessary to end up with one truly platform-independent format. The first was merging TrueType and PostScript into the new OpenType font format. This was jointly done by Microsoft and Adobe during the 1990s. OpenType supported complex scripts, was Unicode based and the fonts only needed one file. And when Apple introduced macOS 10 in 2001, they gave up their old way of storing fonts in a way that was incompatible with Windows. So since almost 20 years, any font with the file extension TTF or OTF should work on all major operating systems. By the way, those file extensions are often misunderstood, but I already covered that in an earlier episode called OpenType vs. TrueType. Feel free to check that out as well if you haven't watched it yet. And if you like this video, feel free to hit the subscribe button and the bell icon to get notifications for new episodes.